I remember as a kid stepping into this room in Super Mario Land 2 and looking at this obnoxious nightmare fuel. A blood-curdling 8-bit laugh coupled with this great value version of Mario hopping off this throne and charging at you. Grade A Nintendo weirdness. This is the very first appearance of Wario, an enigma within the Mario franchise that has gone from this hot mess to a well-established and, dare I say, charming character? But how did he come to meet Mario, and eventually get two series that stood on their own feet? Let's dig a little deeper into the origins of Wario and find out. I am the Mentok, and welcome everyone to Origin Oracle. Kick back, grab some snacks, and let's head back in time. Destroy Mario! Wario's debut game was none other than Super Mario Land 2's Six Golden Coins, released in 1992 for the Game Boy. This time, the game takes place on Mario's own private island, known simply as Mario Land, complete with his own castle and a massive mechanical version of himself. I guess saving the Mushroom Kingdom a couple of times made Mario a very rich man, and possibly a narcissist. Please bring me pizza and uh, make sure that these boxes are not recycled. The story begins shortly after the events of Super Mario Land, as Mario returns from saving Princess Daisy from the evil alien Tatanga in the Empire of Sarasaland. <clears throat> you should go check that video out. But before Mario can head back to start sipping Mai Tais in his throne room, it looks like Wario has hypnotized all the inhabitants of the island and conquered Mario's castle while he was away. I also like that the story in the instructions booklet is told from Mario's perspective, who mentions that Wario has been jealous of his popularity ever since they were boys. We'll look more into that later. For now, Mario has to go track down the six golden coins that Wario spread around the island since they serve as the keys to his castle. And you'd think Mario would take these with him if Wario has tried this multiple times already. Anyway, Mario sets off to the six major zones on his island to get back each of the six golden coins, each guarded by a different boss like Witch and Big Bird. I know I complained about the lack of localization for the boss names from the first Super Mario Land, but these are definitely a bit plain. So Mario Land is split up into the Tree Zone, Space Zone, Macro Zone, Pumpkin Zone, this play sure feels haunted. Turtle Zone, and Mario Zone, which gives this game a really diverse set of levels each with much more elaborate backgrounds and level design than the first game. <gasps> Topanga. Yes, they even featured Tatanga as a boss in the Space Zone, returning as Wario's minion to get revenge against Mario. So while Mario here is collecting the golden coins, let's see how this game and Wario came to be. Super Mario Land 2's development was once again handed back to Nintendo R&D 1, the team responsible for the first Super Mario Land title, and Gunpei Yokoi would return as the producer. This would be yet another title without the involvement of Shigeru Miyamoto, who worked with another department, Nintendo Entertainment Analysis and Development. And if you're curious, they are probably working on Super Mario Kart around this time. The developers of Super Mario Land 2 wanted to take another departure from what was already established in Mario titles. One of these major changes was removing a princess from the equation, and instead having to have Mario strive to get something back that once belonged to him. But who would he be fighting against? Well, the team made several attempts to determine this and rejected many designs for the game's antagonist in the process. Hiroji Kiyotake was a young developer on the team at the time and served as one of the directors for the game. He'd be the one to introduce the idea of Wario, with his name being one of the very first things they all agreed upon. The name itself is a combination of Warui, the Japanese word for bad, and Mario. And it just so happens if you flip the M on Mario's cap, you get a W. I guess we can thank the alphabet for that one. You're welcome! So Kiyotake would work with the assistant character designer Takehiko Hosokawa to flesh out the details, wanting to give a Bluto to Mario's Popeye. And seeing they did the same thing to come up with Donkey Kong, Popeye really deserves our thanks for all the inspiration he's brought into the Mario universe. The design would be finalized by none other than Yoichi Kotabe, the lead artist for the Mario series at that time with him drawing inspiration from both Bluto and Stromboli, one of the antagonists from Disney's Pinocchio. Oh, and if you guys were wondering, Wario weighs 308 pounds, and this is what he looks like on the inside. I never asked for this. So this detail isn't crazy important, but I found it funny that Kiyotake's favorite enemy in the game was the bee fly in the tree and macro zones. The way they're programmed, you can take them out by just jumping on them since they fly away too fast. And apparently this amused Kiyotake to the point where he was laughing out loud when he first interacted with them, and mentioned how excited he was to see players get frustrated while struggling to take them out. So if you all ever wondered if game developers laugh themselves to sleep at your misfortune in a video game, <laughs> I am 
<laughs> the answer is yes. This game is a classic gem, and even though it obviously served as a sequel to Super Mario Land, it's an improvement in every possible way. It's lengthier, more challenging, has interesting level themes, and a banging soundtrack by Nintendo sound veteran and Yoshi's voice actor, Kazumi Totaka. I definitely recommend checking this out if you haven't. It still holds up pretty well and even has a ROM hack called Super Mario Land 2 DX that gives the entire game a splash of color, which honestly breathes new life into it. Anyway, let's see how Mario's doing. Oh nice, you have the last golden coin. Well, it's off to Mario's castle to finally take down Wario, and we've come full circle with Wario grinding his feet on Mario's couch. This is an interesting boss battle in itself, as Wario goes through three phases using different power-ups that Mario has been utilizing within the course of the game. Despite Wario's best efforts, Mario wins the day, and Wario is reduced to a crying mess on the floor. This was a nice touch. But with Mario's castle reclaimed and peace restored to his lands, what happens to Wario? Well, before we get into that, I wanted to take a look at the earliest point chronologically in Wario's timeline. Seeing as Mario mentions them in the manual for Super Mario Land, it's safe to say that they've met before, but where exactly did they meet? Well, we'd see their very first meeting in a game known as Yoshi's Island DS. I spoke about this game in more detail in Mario's origin video, but I think we need to talk about it for Wario's sake here. So in Yoshi's Island DS, Bowser goes back in time to kidnap a bunch of babies from the Mushroom Kingdom in hopes to find the seven star children, a set of kids that have magical stars within them that, when collected, can make someone the ruler of the universe. I don't know how that works, but that's what the story says. Baby Mario, Luigi, and Peach are kidnapped by Kamek and the Toadies, but this kidnapping is cut short by the stork who's finally had it with these guys coming to kidnap babies. This scuffle causes Kamek and the Toadies to drop Mario and Peach, and they fall into the care of the Yoshis, who go on an adventure to stop Bowser and save all the children. We see baby Wario as one of these babies who was also kidnapped, but the Toadies couldn't take his crying anymore so they abandoned him in a cave. I gotta say, that's pretty funny. Yoshi, along with the other babies, find Wario and take him along for the adventure. Chronologically, this serves as Mario and Wario's very first meeting. There's not much to baby Wario here as they based a lot of his personality on his future greedy persona, with him even leaving the group for a bit to join bandits. And later on, he would even feud with baby Bowser for a bit over treasure. Yoshi's Island DS is one of those Mario plots that you don't think too hard about, especially with this baby DK being the source of a lot of debate but I'll save that rabbit hole for another video. We get a little more context to Mario and Wario's earlier encounters in 1993 from a short comic series called Mario vs. Wario, published within the pages of Nintendo Power issue number 44. <laughs> the comic was intended to give a little bit more background on why Wario is so adversarial to Mario. And it opens with Mario getting a letter from Wario inviting him to a party at his house so they can catch up after 20 years. So after getting the letter, Mario's actually pretty excited to go visit Wario and takes a moment to reminisce the good times that they had as children on his way there. Meanwhile, we see that Wario never enjoyed their time together, accusing Mario of bullying him the whole time, especially when they played cowboys as children. Out of the 1,255 times they played cowboys, Wario only got to be the sheriff once. You find out most of the misfortune here that Wario is describing isn't exactly Mario's fault, but the grudge has already been born as Wario intends to get his revenge upon Mario's arrival. Most of the events in this comic has Mario being ambushed by the bosses from Super Mario Land 2, but he just kind of naively stumbles his way through each of these encounters. Like in his fight with Witch, she throws pot lids at him and he ends up latching it onto his shoes. He ends up just thanking her and uses them to walk across water on his way to Wario's. And I don't sense any snark here from Mario, I just think he legitimately thinks these bosses are playing around with him. Anyway, Mario finally arrives at Wario's castle and immediately Wario attacks, but just by pulling his air plug on his clothes, Wario deflates down to a much smaller size and once again accuses Mario of always being a bully. This seems to be complete news to Mario and he tells Wario to let bygones be bygones and to stop being a wimp? Hmm. Maybe Mario actually is a bully. To add insult to injury, the comic ends with Mario whipping out the old sheriff outfit to traumatize Wario once again. So this comic was re-released a couple of times with a reprint in the Super Mario Adventures comic and later as a downloadable file on the Wario Land 4 website. Speaking of which, this website was called Welcome to Greedville, which apparently is called the hometown of Wario. You had the opportunity to play games at Wario's arcade and earn Wario bucks and then spend those bucks at the Wario Mart so you can get like wallpapers and screensavers and all that cool 
cool stuff. Yo, leave me a comment if you still use a screensaver, bro. I had to take a second to cover Welcome to Greedville because I miss when web pages used to do things like that. I don't think it's clear whether this was supposed to be a simple retelling of Super Mario Land 2 or if it serves as events that happened before that game. I'll let you all be the judge. Either way, it gives us a rare look at some early interactions between Mario and Wario, and this also paints Wario here as a more misunderstood character if anything else. So with Wario being ousted from Mario's castle, Nintendo wasn't finished with him yet, with the team at Nintendo R&D 1 coming together again to make his very own title. There was one game in between that that wasn't made by them though. A Japanese exclusive puzzle platform title called Mario and Wario was released for the Super Famicom in 1993, but this time it was developed by a tiny indie company at the time called Game Freak. <coughs> oh shit! Yeah, so not only was this exclusive in Japan, but you needed a Super Famicom mouse to play. Essentially, Mario, Peach, Luigi, and Yoshi are looking for some forest fairy to find happiness. I guess they were all going through something at that time. Anyway, they lose Luigi, and while heading off to find him in the forest, Wario just throws a bucket from the sky onto Mario's head. Mario. I, I don't know, I think Mario deserves this. Anyway, instead of pulling it off his head, you control the forest fairy Wanda with the mouse, helping to guide him to Luigi at the end of each level. It's a pretty simple concept, and this game doesn't really give any extra details on Wario himself, but I thought it would be interesting to bring up, seeing as this is one of the smaller titles Game Freak put out at the time to bring in some cash to work on the first Pokemon title. They did also work on a Yoshi game before this, simply called Yoshi for the Game Boy and NES, which would serve as their first contract with Nintendo, so to an extent, Mario, Yoshi, and Wario all played a part in getting Pokemon off the ground. How about that? Okay, now let's talk about Wario Land. Wario's first title of his own would serve as a sequel to Super Mario Land 2. They even used the subtitle Super Mario Land 3, so I guess they really wanted people to know that this was technically a Mario game. Released in early 1994, you play as Wario on a quest to get his own castle after getting kicked out of Mario's. He sets out to steal a golden statue of Princess Peach to sell for enough money to buy his castle. I love the manual's version of this by the way. One day, Wario was practicing being mean. There you go, that's an actual pastime for Wario. The manual goes on to say that Wario heard a rumor that the statue of Peach was already stolen by the pirates of Kitchen Island, known as the Brown Sugar Pirates, with their infamous leader, Captain Syrup, being known worldwide for being a rotten, ruthless man. So Wario sets out to go steal it from them, and from the jump this game takes the basics from Mario, but adds a nice twist by putting more emphasis on branching paths, exploration, and coin collecting. The amount of coins you have will slightly change the ending of the game, so definitely a nice touch. Wario has his indestructible charge attack and power-ups of his very own, which definitely is a welcome change to the Mario formula. I remember the appeal of playing as the villain for once and feeling so powerful as Wario and just growing to love how goofy he was. So when he reaches the final showdown at Syrup Castle with the Brown Sugar Pirates, you find out that Captain Syrup is a woman. What? Yeah, this was supposed to be a big twist, they even hid that from the player in the manual. But before Wario can claim the statue from her, she summons a genie to kill him. But Wario defeats it and grabs the lamp as treasure as well. With Captain Syrup defeated and the Peach statue found, it's time for Wario to claim his prize. <laughs> Wow, maybe Mario is actually a bully. I'm just kidding. I know he's just reclaiming the statue, but this is a pretty funny cameo nonetheless. It's okay though. Wario has a whole genie to grant him wishes now, so in the end, he still gets his castle, but he has to pay the genie with all the money and treasures he's gathered on his adventure. Yo, kill me with this! So depending on how well the player does, the ending changes here, with the best options being a whole planet or a castle. And if he really sucked at the game, the genie will give Wario his very own birdhouse. For some reason, this seems like the more fitting ending. And so that ends Wario Land, solidifying him as a permanent character in the Mario universe. The success of this game opened the door for a whole Wario Land series, with the follow-up game Virtual Boy Wario Land being released for the Virtual Boy in 1995. Now I won't go down the whole Virtual Boy rabbit hole in this video, but just know this system was Nintendo's attempt at a virtual reality console but everything about it was rather lackluster. Gunpei Yokoi, creator of the Game Boy, was the head of this project and by extension got some of the Wario Land team to develop Virtual Boy Wario Land, bringing Wario back for another treasure hunting adventure. Ultimately, the Virtual Boy was dubbed a failure and discontinued within a year, only selling 770,000 units within its lifetime. This was unfortunately when Gunpei Yokoi would step down and leave Nintendo. 
but not before he helped complete the creation of the Game Boy Pocket. Tragically, he'd pass away a year later after being struck by two automobiles while checking the damage on his car after a minor fender bender. Say what you will about this man and the Virtual Boy, but he was one hell of an inventor. Rest in peace, Yokoi-san. Despite the failure of the Virtual Boy, the Wario Land series would go on, spawning several other titles that now place the focus on Wario's treasure hunting adventures. And these games introduce totally different enemies and characters from what we've already seen in Mario's games, giving Wario Land titles their own charm and identity. And I gotta say, Wario World for the GameCube has probably one of the best pause screens of all time because of this song right here. Wario was also heavily featured in the Super Mario manga that ran from 1988 to 1998, published by Kodansha. I discussed this a little more in the Daisy video, but this manga also has adaptations of Super Mario Land 6 Golden Coins and Wario Land Super Mario Land 3. We see Wario introduce pretty much how he debuted in the games, with him taking over Mario's castle while Mario is busy smooching with Daisy. There's a lot of hilarious gags within this manga, and it even involves Luigi, Peach, and Daisy within the events of Super Mario Land 2. We get to see all the zones and bosses from the game as well, and the manga puts its own creative and hilarious spin on these encounters. This was the same volume where Wario transforms Daisy into Wallow Daisy, and she starts transforming Luigi and Peach into Waluigi and Wallow Peach. There are definitely some spicy interactions here. In the end, Mario and the others collect all the golden coins, and he has this epic showdown with Wario at the top of the castle. And honestly, I'm surprised at how many pages this fight takes. Kazuki Motoyama went all out on this fight, but in the end, Mario is once again victorious. But shout out to the chef over at the Fungi Forums for archiving this manga. This hero put everything he had in one place, and this seems to be one of the few places to find scans of this series on the internet. I'll link this in the description below so you all can check it out. Wario would also go on to be featured in almost every Mario spin-off and sports title, and has been a part of the Smash roster since Super Smash Bros. Brawl. But before I go on to his famous WarioWare series, I have to take a second to talk about his voice. We first hear his voice in Mario Kart 64, but there are two different voice actors at play here. The international version of Mario Kart 64 featured Charles Martinet as the voice actor for Wario. I didn't mention him in Mario or Luigi's video, but this man breathes so much life and personality into the Mario cast. He's the voice of Mario, Luigi, Wario, and Waluigi, and truly manages to capture the essence of their characters with the limited speech that they're given within these games. So even though Nintendo clearly portrays Wario as a greedy, bratty, and somewhat goofy character, I'd say that Martinet's portrayal of him is the icing on the cake. There was one other voice actor Wario had for the Japanese version of Mario Kart 64, and all versions of Mario Party 1 and 2. He was voiced by German translator Thomas Spindler. In 2015, Spindler left a comment on a YouTube video called Wario Speaks German, which has a voice line from Mario Party with Wario saying, So I missed. So I missed. Which translates to Aw Darn in English. Spindler's comment mentions that the Nintendo staff envisioned Wario to be German and directed Spindler to voice him with that in mind. But with Charles Martinet fully taking on the role at some point, that German background is more or less gone, with Martinet giving him a more Italian portrayal. Just a little side note, I swore that Wario was saying, Oh, I missed this whole time. So this little fact here has closed a chapter for me, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. Wario has one other popular series that gained some traction over the years, and it is known as WarioWare. The first game in the series, WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, was released for the Game Boy Advance in 2003. This was a rather big departure from Wario's previous adventures, with him deciding to settle down and start up a video game studio called WarioWare Inc. to legitimately bring in some cash. It's still crazy to me that after all we've discussed today, Wario just said screw it and decided to open up a small business. This series was made by, you guessed it, Nintendo R&D 1, who were inspired by a game they created called Mario Artist Polygon Studio for the Nintendo 64 Dynamic Drive. If you're not familiar with the 64DD, it was a disc attachment for the N64 that was only released in Japan in 1999. It was ultimately cancelled in the United States since it performed so poorly. Regardless, Mario Artist Polygon Studio gave players the ability to create 3D objects, add textures to them, and paint them within a sandbox environment. So essentially, taking Mario Paint to the next level. I bring up this game because there's a minigame feature called Sound Bomber, which had the player attempt to get through several minigames in quick succession. Sound familiar? No. Yes, Nintendo R&D 1 wanted to take this formula and build an entire game from it. But why Wario as the star? Well, developer Yoshio Sakamoto mentions, quote, 
We got the idea of using Wario and the other characters because we couldn't think of anyone else who would be best for the role. Wario is always doing stupid things and is really idiotic, so we thought him and the rest of the characters would be best for the game. I feel like Sakamoto here used this interview as an excuse to roast Wario. So to keep the ideas flowing, each person on the team came up with their own mini games, and the programmers created their own graphics for each mini game, which is why the art styles are so wildly different between rounds. Miyamoto was also excited about the game, giving it the slogan Saita Saitan Saisoku, meaning more, shorter, faster which definitely rolls off the tongue better in Japanese. And with that, the WarioWare series was born, featuring the gameplay of mindless intuitive microgames back to back in rapid succession as the game increases in speed and difficulty for the player. The game features a whole new set of characters from a town called Diamond City and are introduced as Wario's friends, helping him to make microgames for WarioWare Inc. Their ventures are actually successful, but in classic Wario fashion, he tries to swindle his employees and makes a break for his escape rocket with all the money that they earned. But Dr. Krygor here accidentally hits the rocket. Oh my god! Which causes Wario and his money to fall into the sea, and he dies forever. Just kidding. There were eight more WarioWare titles after this. Now, I know I didn't cover everything there is to know about Wario, like the fact that he had a spin off called Wario's Woods, or the fact that he likes strawberry crepes as his favorite food until it was changed to garlic. I didn't cover everything, but I damn near tried. That's where the comments come in. Let me know your favorite things about Wario in the comments below, and what you'd like to see with the character going forward. This has been the Mentok with another Origin Oracle. Be safe out there. The Prophet has spoken. <laughs>